Prologue and Chapters 1 through 3 of The Lepers of Molokai. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Lepers of Molokai by Charles Warren Stoddard. Prologue. The afternoon was waning in the tropical seaport. Already the heat was tempered and the glare softened by the humidity of the slowly approaching dusk a little while and the sun would sink silently into the immeasurable abyss beyond the waves and the brief delicious twilight bathed for a moment only in the splendor of the afterglow would adorn itself with clusters of trembling stars at such an hour beguiled with reveries and soothed by the exquisite fragrance that exhales at dewfall i was startled by a piercing cry that seemed the last agonizing protest of a riven heart not one voice only broke upon the stillness but another and another and yet another until a chorus of despair rang shrilly over the low-roofed cottages in the grove that stood between me and the not far distant shore with no little emotion i hurried seaward and speedily overtook a melancholy procession of weeping women followed by a few silent people who were being conducted with decent haste toward the esplanade of honolulu the miserable beings with the dazed look of lingering death in their fearful countenances were soon disposed on the deck of a small outward-bound craft and then in a few moments that intervened between the casting off of the shoreline and the sudden impulse of the little steamer as she swung about in midstream and made bravely for the mouth of the harbor the pitiful wail of men women and children was renewed those grouped upon the extreme edge of the wharf were wringing their hands over the water while rivers of tears coursed down their ashen cheeks the others upon the deck of the departing vessel brooded for a time as in dumb agony but anon an unearthly cry rang over the tranquil sea it was their long farewell the sun just touching the horizon seemed to pause for a moment while the great deep burst into a sheet of flame tongues of fire darted and played among the wavelets as they tossed in the evening breeze and the broad rays shot from cloud to cloud painting them with glory and crowning the peaks of the beautiful island with red gold even the palm trees were gilded and their plumes glistened as they swayed rhythmically to the low melody of the tide that ebbed beneath them so faded that ill-starred bark like a moat in the shimmering sea a few moments only and the splendor died away the twilight glow of the tropics is as brief as it is intense and the sudden coming of night drew a veil over a picture that though frequent is nevertheless painful to the least sympathetic observer darkness had come the silence that came with it was broken only by the splash of ripples under the bow of some passing canoe or the low moan of the water upon the distant reef but the mourners were still crouching upon the edge of the deck whence their eyes had caught the last glimpse of the fading forms of those whom they were never again to behold in the flesh for those despairing but unresisting souls swallowed up in the transfiguration of the sunset were lepers snatched from the breast of sympathy and from the arms of love doomed to the hopeless degradation of everlasting banishment and born in the night to that dim island whose melancholy shores are the sole refuge of these hostages to death an island as solitary as silent as serene as dreamland mournful molokai chapter one for three years and more i had been a resident of the hawaiian or sandwich islands twenty years before i had visited that little kingdom and had again and again returned to it with the ardor of first love the kingdom which has been called the sweetest and the saddest in the world has ever possessed for me the greatest interest 
and i have learned to know and to appreciate the charmingly ingenuous islanders who while they have acquired all the rights and titles to civilization have likewise been visited by one of the most dreaded ills that flesh is heir to the asiatic leprosy many a time i had longed to revisit the leper settlements on molokai sixteen years before i had first looked upon that ill-fated spot a village that was then considerably smaller for the lepers were scattered throughout the kingdom but my desire was not easily satisfied for there is a justifiable disinclination on the part of the government to permit the curious to explore the settlement and circulate sensational reports concerning the life of the lepers in their banishment a permission to visit the settlement was finally by the order of the president of the board of health signed by the secretary of the board and forwarded to my address together with a polite letter from the president of the board stating the cause of its delay it seems that they had resolved that no further permissions should be granted hoping thus to keep secret the painful truths concerning leprosy in the hawaiian kingdom provided with this necessary passport i was doubly fortunate in being invited to join two of the government physicians who were about to visit molokai professionally on a tour of inspection thus one afternoon in october eighteen eighty four i shook hands with dr george k fitch and dr arthur moritz on board the inner island steamer like like and shortly after we three were on our way to molokai there was a sunset at sea a late moonrise and about midnight we came to anchor off kuanakakai the chief port of the island and were presently rowed a long mile to shore in a whaleboat manned by kanakas we seemed to have picked this jovial crew up at sea for the boat was awaiting our arrival far out beyond the reef safe on shore we found the airy cottage of a high chiefess at our disposal willing hands brewed deep bowls of chicken broth and there was an abundance of good bread for our refreshment this might easily be called a square meal in many parts of the hawaiian islands where the markets are few and meagerly supplied our cottage stood close to the shore the moon was shining upon the sea and sifting through the feathery boughs of the mesquite trees over the white sand that had drifted all about us natives gathered around us talking drowsily yet with no thought of sleep for the arrival of the weekly steamer is the one event in their aimless and easy lives small sleep for us that night the doctors were diagnosing leprosy over their cigars i listened or dreamed of my former experiences on the island which has come to be known as one of the most interesting though the least visited and most solitary of the group we dozed a little toward dawn dozed to the murmur of wavelets that broke very softly upon the shore not a stone's throw distant but we were hoping to be in the saddle and away before sunrise and were astir betimes as is usually the case with the happy-go-lucky hawaiian neither beast nor human appeared until nine o'clock in the day but we were so glad to get started even at that late hour that we forgave and forgot in a moment it is a long hot dusty ride from the beach to the far edge of the windward cliffs of molokai there is no halfway house no roadside spring no shelter from the fierce glare of the sun the salt sea trades blow over the ridge of the island clothed in clouds of fine red dust but one is constantly ascending into purer clearer sweeter air and when the rain-swept highlands are reached the scattering groves of kukui and kamani trees the deep and verdant ravines musical with sparkling rivulets the whir of wings the delicious temperature the cloud-capped and almost inaccessible heights that shelter the upper regions beguile one into the belief that he has actually entered another zone 
at the end of the third long and monotonous hour we came to a halt and were hospitably entertained by mr r w meyer a pioneer of molokai agent of the board of health and superintendent of the leper settlement on this beautiful height he stands between the world and those who are no longer of it and but for my passport he could have retained me a prisoner in his family until the return of my companions after their tour of inspection it is but a mile or two from the meyer mansion to the brink of the cliff where we were to abandon our horses there was no longer any need of haste and we tarried in delightful conversation with the gentleman whose hospitality is famous and whose home life is almost patriarchal the ride to the cliff through a gently undulating land rich in perennial verdure was most exhilarating our well-baited beasts seeming to enjoy the bracing atmosphere as well as we followed with a light foot the trail that wound among umbrageous groves where the squirrel and the rabbit skipped nimbly anon through grassy meadows the pheasant and the plover darted from underfoot at our approach or beside reedy pools where the wild duck flocked fearlessly and were too bold or too weary after their long flight from labrador to take wing again cattle and sheep covered the hills but the shy deer were hidden in the brush where the quail piped and called and the wild dove cooed indeed it was difficult to believe that we were still in the tropics for all these birds and beasts save only the far-flying duck are importations chiefly the property of the king and each and all of them now thoroughly domesticated suddenly we came upon a rustic bar that blocked the way here we dismounted and a lad who had accompanied us thus far took charge of the animals that were to be led back to the pasturage at mr meyer's there to await our pleasure the little luggage we had brought with us it was as little as possible was deposited on the grass while we approached a jungle that grew upon the edge of the cliff tearing our way through the shrubs and vines we came upon the brink and looked down we were three thousand feet in the air the whole face of the abyss was a cataract of verdure breaking at intervals into a foam of flowers and upon the crest of this cataract we were balanced like the birds of the air surely it was a bird's-eye view that thrilled us at that moment there was a great sweep of sky-blue sea and a greater sweep of sea-blue sky and between the two we hung suspended among the branches that bent under our weight a little sail looking like a snowflake seemed ready to melt in the dreamy and delicious distance a rain cloud was trailing across the horizon but for this feature we would hardly have known where to draw the line for sea and sky were as one far beneath us was a tongue of land thrust out into the sea it was sunburnt and dust-colored blackened at the edges where the rough lava rocks were uncovered and frothed from end to end with tumbling breakers scarcely a tree was visible throughout its length and breadth but it was divided and subdivided by low stone walls into a thousand small lots of every conceivable shape each one perhaps a birthright and all of them no doubt under cultivation formerly for molokai was once densely populated and this isolated portion of the island was in those days a popular resort on one shore of the lowland was a little hamlet a handful of tiny white cottages scattered in a green and sheltered spot on the opposite shore two miles away was another and somewhat larger settlement with its cottages more scattered and its garden spots less green both of these villages were nestling near the cliffs one of them quite in the shadow between the two there were but few habitations and at the farther end of the lowland where it jutted into the sea there were none at all near the centre of the lowland was a small low crater a hillock with a funnel-shaped hollow in the middle of it 
and in the bottom of the hollow a pool of water that rises and falls with the sea tide the whole plain was like a crust over the water with a broken bubble in the midst of it this was the site of the leper settlement on molokai that has been much written about and most written about by those who have never seen it its history is still almost a mystery save to the few who have been in some way associated with it rumors concerning it whether true or false it were difficult to determine have often redounded to the discredit of the hawaiian government certain it is that in some cases the affairs at the settlement have been deliberately perhaps maliciously misrepresented i have read more than one account descriptive of the settlement the writers of which could never have visited molokai even the geography of the territory was imaginary and absurdly incorrect as for the victims of the plague left howling in their last agonies in the columns of the daily press such cases are unknown in the annals of leprosy the sun was still blazing upon the plain below us we were to foot it down the zigzag trail each with his share of luggage it was every man for himself now but the hindermost had the advantage for there was no one to send tiny avalanches of gravel and dirt into his neck during that perilous descent a little later and the long shadows would begin to swing out from the cliff cooling the downward path we resolved to camp for a while on the breezy heights above the sunlit settlement while we thought on the palms and the still waters we had left that morning the health and happiness that sported beside them and on the abomination of desolation we were likely to abide with before the dusk of the evening had begun to shut it out from our eyes chapter two it is now more than half a century since leprosy was introduced into the hawaiian islands it would be quite impossible to point with certainty to the original case but it is generally understood that the seed of the dreadful malady came from asia and came in the person of an ill-fated foreigner he may or may not have been aware of the incalculable injury he was about to inflict upon a nation that had been until the arrival of captain cook in seventeen ninety almost entirely free from the numerous contagious diseases that prevail among civilized communities but the life he led in hawaii was such as to speedily communicate this mortal disease and it was not long before its unmistakable symptoms were developing in every quarter of the kingdom then would have been a proper time in which to check so far as possible the spread of the pestilence yet even then it was perhaps too late the hawaiians are a sociable people they are continually travelling from one country to another they live in the closest intimacy are generous and hospitable to a fault a hawaiian's home is your home the moment you enter it and so long as you choose to lodge there all that is in the house is at your disposal if your wardrobe needs replenishing you are welcome to the wardrobe of the family though the chances are that you would hardly better yourself were you to appropriate the entire stock it may as well be added here that this custom was general in former years but of late the simplicity and generosity of the natives have been so often abused that a stranger is now greeted with some caution and discrimination leprosy develops slowly one may be a leper for months or even years before the symptoms of the disease begin to discover themselves and at last become externally evident then they are unmistakable but by this time great mischief may have been done and done innocently enough perhaps for the leper will have but recently become conscious of his state thus leprosy spread through the kingdom and spread to such an alarming degree that it became necessary to take public action in the matter the disease is acknowledged by the medical world to be incurable it has ever been so considered and as yet though a thousand experiments have been tried 
the most hopeful of the scientists have abandoned the field in despair the mosaic law was explicit in regard to the treatment of those afflicted by leprosy they were to be set apart without the gates and to walk alone crying unclean unclean their garments were to be burned their houses cleansed and all direct communication between the clean and the unclean was expressly prohibited in like manner segregation was considered to be the only hope of the hawaiian race a suitable spot was sought to which the lepers might be removed where they might be tenderly cared for and jealously guarded and there they were to end their miserable days the prospect of life banishment alarmed the natives both the sick and the hale they were not and they still are not afraid of the disease they are a most affectionate people they love their friends with a love passing the love of woman moreover they are fearless of death at heart they are fatalists when the health agent of the government went forth in search of the afflicted hoping to gather them together house them feed them and clothe them at the government expense he found great difficulty in securing any of them at the approach of this health officer the lepers would be secreted by friends who were willing to brave possible contagion rather than part with those so dear to them sometimes the unfortunates were surprised and given into the hands of the police who were to have charge of them until they could be shipped to the new settlement eyewitnesses of the heart-rending scenes that followed these captures will not soon forget the agony of the final partings terrible as was the emergency the voice of the government could justly say with hamlet i must be cruel only to be kind it was a question of saving the remnant of the nation at the price of the hopeless few the little lowland at our feet was found to be by all odds the most desirable locality in the whole group for a settlement such as was proposed there are few white people on the island of molokai this lowland was seldom perhaps never visited certainly there was no necessity of its being visited by those who were not concerned in the welfare of the natives the few settlers old settlers certainly still rusticating on the breezy and unsheltered plains below us could dispose of their birthrights if they chose to do so or they could remain for there was abundant room for all who were likely to find sanctuary in that sad spot there was ample sustenance on both land and sea fishers were living among the foam-crested rocks the husbandman would find an immediate market for his produce and he was alike fearless and hospitably disposed indeed all things considered no better refuge for the leper could be found and so the little lowland under the great windward cliff of molokai was speedily and permanently secured transportation began immediately and for twenty years it has continued it has continued in spite of the pitiful protestations of friends and relations and in spite of the first instinct of humanity the natural appeal of the sympathetic it has continued and it will it must continue until the last vestige of leprosy has disappeared from the kingdom hawaii in thus separating the clean from the unclean is following somewhat tardily perhaps the wise and vigorous example of the older commonwealths of the world sir james y simpson baronet of the university of edinburgh in his learned and conclusive essay on leprosy and the leper hospitals of england and scotland gives a list of one hundred and ten leper houses that existed in great britain from the twelfth to the sixteenth century he says by astruce bach and others it has been averred that the leprosy of the middle ages was introduced from the east by those who returned from the crusades though the disease was not unknown on the continent at an earlier period 
and there were two lazar houses at canterbury during the reign of william the conqueror seven years previous to the first crusade Mezere records that in the twelfth century there was scarcely a town or village in france without its leper hospital moratori gives a similar account of the extent of the disease during the middle ages in italy old scandinavian historians amply prove that the inhabitants of the kingdoms of northern europe equally became its unfortunate victims in england and scotland during the same period leprosy was as rife as it was on the neighboring continent almost every large town in great britain had a leper hospital or a village near it for the reception and isolation of the diseased some of the cities were supplied with more than one lazar house there were six of these establishments at norwich or its immediate vicinity and five at lynn regis in that age when leprosy flourished laws were enacted by nearly all the powers of europe to arrest its diffusion among their subjects the popes issued bulls regarding the ecclesiastical separation and rights of the afflicted a particular order of knighthood was instituted to watch over the sick according to the tenor of various civil codes and local enactments in great britain and other countries says a writer when a person became afflicted with leprosy he was considered as legally and politically dead and lost the privileges belonging to his right of citizenship thus we dwelt upon a theme that was now continually uppermost in our minds and while we sat upon the brow of the cliff lo the shadows had swung out over the plain and tinted the shallow shoreline of the sea a deeper indigo come let us be going said one of the party whereupon we shouldered our packs and with staff in hand approaching the precipitous trail single file took the first downward step it was like plunging into space chapter three we were dropping slipping shambling down a sharp flank of the cliff that cut the air like a flying buttress by a series of irregular steps we slowly descended leaping from rock to rock when practicable but often putting off our packs sliding into the little ledge below and then dragging the packs after us on each side of us was a dense growth of brush a kind of natural parapet over which we could hurl a stone a thousand feet into the sheer depths but we could not hear it strike sea birds soared above us and below us sometimes they hovered just above our heads and eyed us curiously then with a stroke of their powerful wings they would soar away with a cry that was half fearful half defiant my brain whirled as i watched them poised in mid-air and thought of the awful distance between them and the earth for two hours we continued to descend often pausing for breath sometimes sinking through weariness always wondering if this were not the last turn in the zigzag that seemed to wind on to the end of time now and then we came upon the carcasses of cattle that had perished in this awful path for herdsmen are sometimes driven down the steep incline to supply the leper market and there is always some loss of life in these cases at intervals we treaded deliciously cool and shady groves from under whose dense boughs we could look slantwise into the settlement and see men and women moving to and fro and so at last we came out upon the treeless plain faint and footsore at least this was my state and began to slowly make our way toward kalaweo the chief leper village about a mile and a half distant at the lodge a neat frame building reserved for the exclusive use to the, of the visiting physician and his friends we deposited our packs left orders for an early dinner and proceeded toward the neighboring village the first glimpse of kalaweo might lead a stranger to pronounce it a thriving hamlet of perhaps five hundred inhabitants 
its single street is bordered by neat whitewashed cottages with numerous little gardens of bright flowers and clusters of graceful and decorative tropical trees it lies so near the base of the mountain that not a few of the huge stones that were loosened by the rains have come thundering down the heights and rolled almost to the fences that enclose the village suburbs as we pass down the street dr fitch was greeted on every hand he had been expected for it was his custom to visit the settlement monthly and many a shout of welcome was raised and many an aloha the fond salutation of the race rang from doorway window and veranda one group of stalwart fellows swung their hats in air and gave three lusty cheers for kauka the doctor topping them off with a burst of childish laughter thus far inasmuch as we had scarcely looked into the faces of these villagers they seemed to us the merriest and most contented community in the world but let it be remembered that we were all in the deep afternoon shadow and our arrival was the sensation of the hour by the roadside in the edge of the village between it and the sea stood a little chapel the cross upon its low belfry and the larger cross in the cemetery beyond assured us that the poor villagers were not neglected in the hour of their extremity as we drew near the churchyard gate was swung open for us by a troop of laughing urchins who stood hat in hand to give us welcome now for the first time i noticed that they were all disfigured that their faces were seared and scarred their hands and feet maimed and sometimes bleeding their eyes like the eyes of some half-tamed animal their mouths shapeless and their whole aspect in many cases repulsive these were lepers so were they each of them that had greeted us as we passed through the village so are they all with a few privileged exceptions who dwell in the two little villages under the cliffs by the sea other lepers gathered about us as we entered the churchyard the chapel steps were crowded with them for a stranger is seldom seen at kalaweo and as their number increased it seemed as if each newcomer was more horrible than the last until corruption could go no farther and flesh suffer no deeper dishonor this side of the grave they voluntarily drew aside as we advanced closing in behind us and encircling us at every step the chapel door stood ajar in a moment it was thrown open and a young priest paused upon the threshold to give us welcome his cassock was worn and faded his hair tumbled like a schoolboy's his hands stained and hardened by toil but the glow of health was in his face the buoyancy of youth in his manner while his ringing laugh his ready sympathy and his inspiring magnetism told of one who in any sphere might do a noble work and who in that which he has chosen is doing the noblest of all works this was father damien the self-exiled priest the one clean man in the midst of his flock of lepers we were urged to dine with him good soul he was conscious of asking us to the humblest of tables but we were a thousand times welcome to the best he had when we assured him that our dinner was even then in preparation and that we had packed over with us all the way from honolulu butter flour and other delicacies he insisted upon our adding a fowl to our bill of fare with his compliments and his blessing having with a few words dispersed the group of lepers it was constantly increasing in numbers and horrors he brought from his cottage into the churchyard a handful of corn and scattering a little of it upon the ground he gave a peculiar cry in a moment his fowls flocked from all quarters they seemed to descend out of the air in clouds they lit upon his arms and fed out of his hands they fought for a footing upon his shoulders and even upon his head they covered him with caresses and with feathers 
he stood knee-deep among as fine a flock of fowls as any fancier would care to see they were his pride his playthings and yet a brace of them he sacrificed upon the altar of friendship and bade us go in peace such was father damien of Kalaweo. end of chapter three Chapters 4 through 6 of The Lepers of Molokai by Charles Warren Stoddard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 That evening we sat at dinner in the doctor's lodge and ate of the priest's feathered darlings. We were served by a young Hawaiian in the incipient stages of leprosy, whose leprous wife had kindly and carefully prepared our food for us none of us seemed to have the least fear of these good people perhaps because as yet they showed little or no trace of the disease that was devouring them piecemeal suitable precautions are taken to preserve the lodge from contamination it is securely locked at all times the key is given only into the doctor's hands or those of such few foreign guests as visit Kalaweo by permission of the board of health it will readily be conjectured how very few these are the scanty furniture of the lodge is kept scrupulously clean anxious inquirers who seek the visiting physician at all hours often those that are unseasonable are supposed to stop at the gate and carry on the consultation over the pickets thereof but this they sometimes forget to do there were several of these callers during the evening while we sat on the sheltered veranda looking off upon the quiet village the wind blew briskly from the sea it rattled the windows and hissed through the long grass in the dooryard the huge cliff before us towered into the very sky touched now and again with beauty as the clouds swept from the face of the moon one by one the twinkling lights in the village disappeared and when the curfew tolled not a glimmer was left and the only sound we heard was the clatter of green window shutters and the boom of the sea as it broke upon the rocks by the shore there was but one topic of conversation during all our stay that was of course the leprosy we had it for breakfast dinner and tea morning and evening and even far into the night we considered the subject in all its lights and bearings the theme was inexhaustible and possessed for us at the moment an almost horrible interest and think of it for a moment this very day vestiges of the plague are to be found in localities the most dissimilar in regard to temperature climate situation and soil the leper is to be found in sumatra under the equator in parts of iceland almost within the verge of the arctic circle in the temperate regions of both hemispheres as at hamel and araid in the cape district and in the north at madeira and morocco in the dry and arid plains of arabia in the wet and malarious districts of batavia and Suriname, along the shores of guinea and sierra leone and in the interior of africa hindustan asia minor and asiatic russia on the sea coast as at carthage and thousands of feet above the level of the ocean on the tablelands of mexico on some of the islands in the indian chinese caribbean and mediterranean seas and basking in the sunshine in the heart of the pacific and yet elsewhere among all of these victims of the most terrible of scourges gathered in communities and lazarettos confined in the remote chambers of pest houses or wandering neglected and alone there is no colony like this at Kalaweo, in which a whole population may be said to share the affliction in common it was hard to realize where we were when the night had shut out the spectacle of those suffering ones hard to believe that we were in any danger even when surrounded by the dead and the dying then someone opened the bible and turning to the book of leviticus 
read how in those days the leprous man was solemnly pronounced unclean how his clothes were rent and he was shunned and his habitation was without the camp how the priest came unto the house and the stones in which the plague was were cast into an unclean place without the city and the house was scraped and the dust of the scrapings was unclean other stones were taken to replace the old stones and they were plastered with fresh mortar then the people waited the result when the priest came again if the plague was spread in the house it was a fretting leprosy in the house and the house was broken down and the stones of it and the timbers and the mortar were carried out of the city into an unclean place and he that went into the house was unclean and his garments were put off as for the garments of the leper if the plague spread in the garment either in the warp or in the woof or in the skin or in any work that was made of skin it was a fretting leprosy and it was burnt in the fire this was the law for the leprosy of a garment and of a house in those days still the wind blew briskly from the sea a delicious coolness was gathering the air was soft and bracing and the crash of the waves like glorious music sometimes a rock came rolling down the cliff a rock loosened by the wild goats that feed there sometimes a wild bird screeched as it swept over us like a shadow it was a weird night we were passing in the weirdest of all places even the royal families were not exempt said the doctor who had been listening to the reading of the mosaic law and they were not henry the third was suspected of being a leper it was a local tradition that the leper house at waterford in ireland was founded by king john father of henry the third in consequence of his son's being afflicted at lismore with an eruption that was thought to be leprosy historians have alleged that henry the fourth was leprous toward the end of his life robert the bruce died of leprosy and baldwin the fourth king of jerusalem died at the age of three and twenty a leper these were the pampered darlings of the throne and these fell victims to the plague which was centered in that little village within whose borders we were domesticated as we retired for the night i could not but think that once in the toils of this insidious charmer for it seems almost to have a fascination for the hawaiian not cedar wood nor scarlet nor hyssop nor clean birds nor ewes of the first year nor measures of fine flour nor offerings of any sort even though they were potent in the days of the prophets shall cleanse us for evermore chapter five there was little sleep that night i was thinking of my first visit to the settlement in eighteen sixty eight when the keeper and his family did what they could to make dr lee the then visiting physician and myself comfortable the walsh family had a history and a sad one it was failing health compelled the retirement of mr walsh from the british army some years previous to my acquaintance with him with his wife and children he sought a home in the colonies at first hope of the young and enthusiastic the last resort of the despairing misfortune and death pursued him from shore to shore discouraged by unprofitable speculations in australia and new zealand he settled for the far distant hawaiian islands seven children had been taken from them by death but one remained a good lad though alas in delicate health subject to physical disorders and therefore a constant source of anxiety upon the arrival of the walshes in honolulu it was announced that a keeper was needed at the new leper settlement one who would make his home with the lepers and devote his entire attention to them mr walsh offered his own and his wife's services and they were accepted the little family at once moved to molokai and took up their residence at kalaweo upon my visit at that time the doctor and i sought shelter under their roof the only refuge available the house was extremely small i think there were but two rooms in it 
but the son was absent for a few days away in the mountains with some companions and the living room in which we sat by day where we ate and which was also a dispensary on a small scale was our sleeping room at night the doctor found his bed in a little alcove while i slept on the lounge i remember the charity the loving kindness and the deep poverty of these gracious people i remember their modest apologies for the table upon which were spread only the barest necessaries of life sea biscuits sopped in milk was a staple in that humble home i remember their efforts at merriment how they tried to make light of their sorrowful strait but their very mirth was pathetic with what tenderness they spoke of their absent boy and his infirmities with what fearful hope they pictured his future and their own one of the half dozen volumes that constituted the family library was father faber's all for jesus it was the mainstay of the house it was taken down at odd moments during the day put into my hands again and again that i might read this or that favorite passage and read it aloud for mr walsh was rapidly losing his sight and his eyes were then shielded by double green glasses husband and wife worked as one in that vineyard many a time was mrs walsh called to the bedside of the dying to lend the aid of her tearful sympathy to some fainting soul in its last agony fifty yea a hundred times a day were these gentle people called to the door to minister to the wants of some pitiful creature and very likely some one whom they had seen but a little while before for they made their rounds frequently between dawn and dark other guests they had no hope of seeing for who would be likely to seek their hospitality as long as they dwelt in that sad place as we were about leaving the settlement mr walsh drew me aside and with charming embarrassment said that he had been searching the house over for some little token to offer me as a souvenir of my visit the only thing he could find in fact almost the only thing he had to offer for he could not part with his crucifix his rosary his two or three pious pictures or his precious volume of father faber was a little pocket map of the city of mexico you are always traveling said he i shall travel no more and some day perhaps this will be of service to you i received it gratefully and said mr walsh i will go to mexico and open this map in memory of your kindness and some day i hope to do so not many months later having returned to san francisco i received a letter in an unfamiliar hand it bore several postmarks and showed signs of some hard usage the letter had evidently gone astray it was dated at least two months before but on reading it i found fresh assurances of the warm friendship of the walsh family it was written in mr walsh's slow and careful hand and conveyed the modest request that if i published anything concerning his poor little settlement i would be good enough to let him see it he added you know we hear so little of the world in Kalawao." the same mail brought me a newspaper from the capital of the kingdom on glancing through it my eye fell upon a paragraph that startled me his letter was still open before me and by the printed lines that grew blurred as i read them i learned that mr walsh having become almost totally blind and beginning to fail so rapidly as to alarm his wife and son it was thought best for the family to return to honolulu and seek medical advice they took the passage in one of the inter-island schooners never noted for their excellent accommodations and set sail the elements were not propitious head winds or calms delayed them and at last when they were nearing port while they reclined upon the deck in the glare of the sun for the atmosphere of the little cabin was intolerable mr walsh was seized with a sudden paroxysm and almost immediately expired the despair of the mother as she bowed over the inanimate form of her husband added to his own natural grief 
so wrought upon the emotions of the son that in a moment he became a raving maniac he had been subject to periods of insanity and now he had gone mad his violence was such that it became necessary to lash him to the mast and in this plight the stricken family ended their mission among the lepers of molokai chapter six it seems we were about to enter the valley of the shadow of death a day had been set apart for the inspection of tenements and of the several wards where the worst cases of leprosy were in charge of leprous friends who were as yet but little crippled by the ravages of the disease the hospital wards a row of long cool buildings arranged on two sides of a breezy and treeless square there is an abundance of fresh air and sunshine in Kalaweo, but these life-giving elements cannot aid the hopeless victims of leprosy. As we approached the wards, we found some of the patients wandering listlessly in the shade of the low-hanging eaves, or lounging in the verandas. Some were sunning themselves at the corners of the buildings. Not a few were within doors, sitting mutely alone, or in groups, or reclining upon the cots that stood in double rows down the length of each ward father damien who had called early to offer his services as escort knew each individual case like the good physician that he is ministering to the bodies as well as to the souls of his flock his finger is upon the pulse of his suffering people as with painful gravity he watches the tide of life slowly ebbing day by day most of these lepers were capable of smiling when spoken to and i believe they would smile in their last breath for of all nations on the face of the globe the hawaiian is perhaps the most amiable and the most ingenuous but what smiles were those that greeted us what horror-stricken faces in which the muscles seemed to have forgotten their office and to be now sporting derisively it was as if the mantle of victor hugo's lom kirit were being striven for by those utterly unconscious of the disgust it necessarily inspires still they smiled responsively like children smiled innocently and amiably but with an expression that was satirical and sometimes almost devilish their swollen faces with the flesh knotted and blotched grew a thousand times more horrible when they smiled and the features bore a look of fixed agony never to be forgotten by one who has beheld it it is a singular and a fortunate fact that the leper suffers but little pain until almost his final hour much inconvenience certainly he endures but endures it patiently and painlessly until the fangs of the loathsome disease strike the vitals and then the end is at hand mondrell an english traveller of the seventeenth century writing of the leprosy he saw in syria says it is a distemper so noisome that it might well pass for the utmost corruption of the human body on this side of the grave such is the case to-day in molokai listen to the diagnosis of the leprosy as it is found in nearly every land under the sun when leprosy is fully developed it is characterized by the presence of dusky red or livid tubercles of different sizes upon the face lips nose eyebrows ears and extremities of the body the skin of the tuberculated face is at the same time thickened wrinkled and shining and the features are very greatly distorted the hair of the eyebrows eyelashes and beard falls off the eyes are often injected and the conjunctiva swelled the pupil of the eye contracts giving the organ a weird cat-like expression the voice becomes hoarse and nasal the sense of smell is impaired or lost and that of touch or common sensation is strangely altered the tuberculated parts which are in the first instance sometimes supersensitive latterly in the course of the disease become paralyzed or anesthetic as the malady progresses the tubercles soften and open 
ulcerations of similar mucous tubercles appear in the nose and throat rendering the breath extremely offensive tubercular masses or leprous tubercles as shown by dissection begin to form internally upon various mucous membranes and on the surface of the kidneys lungs etc cracks fissures and circular ulcers appear on the fingers toes and extremities and joint after joint drops off by a kind of spontaneous gangrene sometimes the upper and sometimes the lower extremities are specially afflicted by this mortification and mutilation of parts dr helbeck an eastern traveller tells us that in looking down from a neighbouring height into the great leper hospital of hamel and arad he saw two lepers sowing peas in the field the one had no hands the other had no feet these members being wasted away by disease the one who wanted hands was carrying the other who wanted feet on his back and he again carried in his hands a bag of seed and dropped a pea every now and then which the other pressed into the ground with his foot cases as deplorable may be found at Kalaweo, but there the maimed are not expected to do any manual labor and for the most part they are surrounded by friends who are able and ready yea eager to serve them as we were passing through one of the wards we found a little heap of humanity drawn up in bed and covered all over with a red woolen blanket some one raised this covering and exposed a withered face the eyes did not open the eyelids which were like thick films quivered feebly the flesh of an arm that lay across the breast was eaten away it looked as if it had been eaten by rats but it was only the fang of the destroyer that had struck there this miserable creature was being fanned by a friend who smiled complacently as he told us that the old man was dying again and again we visited him and three days later found him apparently unchanged without eating or drinking and almost without breathing he lay curled in an ignominious heap of corruption awaiting tardy death his companions were in no wise disconcerted but dozed on the neighboring cots played cards in the corner or sat moodily apart as if watching for some one and so they were they were watching with dogged indifference the approach of the destroyer they could mark his progress inch by inch in the mortifying bodies of their fellows and hour after hour this was the sole diversion of the more moody victims from cottage to cottage across lots through garden spots ablaze with brilliant flowers and rank with shrubs of brightest green lepers were everywhere waiting to receive us they crouched under the thick banana hedges or on the smallest of verandas or squatted upon the floor within doors often we found the walls of the rooms papered with illustrations cut from harper's weekly frank leslie's or the london news and graphic flaring chromolithographs were not wanting nor in many cases a crucifix or a holy picture or the beads but father damien made no distinction in the bestowal of his favors and everywhere he was welcomed as a friend it seems strange to me that those doomed exiles who have only to look upon the disfigured faces of their companions to see the living image of their own have in most cases hearts that are comparatively light and spirits comparatively gay and yet they are all or nearly all of them dwelling within sound of the busy hammer that is shaping the coffins which are to enclose their remains that hammer seemed never idle coffins were piled where they were visible to all who passed the workshop and yet two or three per week are called for and god's acre is crowded with the dead when we escaped from the green labyrinth of the settlement i thought of dante's emerging from the inferno under the guidance of virgil and clasping the hand of father damien i entered his house there to digest the experiences of the day end of chapter six
chapters seven through nine of the lepers of molokai by charles warren stoddard this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven it is a small two-story house with stairs leading from the lower to the upper veranda having seated me in his easiest chair the good priest excused himself for a few moments during which i busied myself in filling some pages of my notebook when he returned he brought with him an improvised supper a bit of meat a dish of rice fried eggs and large bowls of coffee with nuggets of sugar on sea biscuits that served as trays and were afterwards to be eaten all this he had prepared with his own hands together we discussed it and then withdrew to the full enjoyment of a pipe and a cigarette now i assumed the attitude of the interviewer but found my subject a diffident and difficult one it was only after considerable persuasion that i gathered the brief record of his life and even then the modest father was fearful that i might flatter him or give my readers a too favorable impression of one who seemed quite unconscious of having done anything worthy of note i cannot do him justice but here in brief is the story of his career born in louvain belgium january third eighteen forty when he was but four-and-twenty his brother who had just entered the priesthood was ordered to embark for honolulu but at the moment fell sick with typhoid fever young damien who was a theological student at the university having received minor orders and belonging to the same order the society of the sacred hearts of jesus and mary commonly called society of picpu at once wrote to his superior and begged that he might be sent upon the mission in his brother's stead in one week he was on his way to that far country he was ordained upon his arrival in honolulu and for a few years led the life of toil and privation which invariably falls to the lot of the catholic missionary in eighteen seventy three he in common with others of the clergy was invited to be present at the dedication of a beautiful chapel just completed by father lenor at wailuku on the island of maui there he met the bishop who expressed regret that he was still unable to send a priest to molokai for the demand was far in excess of the supply father damien at once said my lord i hear that a small vessel will next week take cattle from kawaii to kalapapa if you will permit me i will go there to help the lepers make their easter duties his request was granted and in company with the bishop and the french consul he landed at the settlement where he found a colony of eight hundred lepers of whom between four and five hundred were catholics a public meeting was immediately called at which the bishop and the consul presided his grace arose to address the singular gathering and said since you have written me so often that you have no priest i leave you one for a little time and imparting the benediction he returned immediately to the vessel which was to sail that very hour father damien added as there is much to be done here by your leave i will not even accompany you to the shore thus the good work was at once begun it was high time the lepers were dying at the rate of from eight to twelve per week the priest had not time to build himself a hut he had not even the material with which to build it and for a season he slept in the open air under a tree exposed to the wind and the rain soon after he received a letter of congratulation from the white residents of honolulu chiefly protestants together with some lumber and a purse of one hundred twenty dollars then he put up his little house and began to feel at home after remaining some weeks at kalaweo he was obliged to go to honolulu there being no more convenient priest to whom he could make his confession he naturally called upon the president of the board of health who seemed much surprised but received the priest with frigid politeness he then asked leave to return to the settlement of molokai and was curtly informed that he might indeed return but that in that case he must remain there for good 
father damien explained to this gentleman how necessary it is for one priest to see another at reasonable intervals in order to make his confession and asked permission to visit lahaina on the island of maui not far from molokai promising to return there directly in a small boat as soon as he had attended to his religious duties this was denied him he was told that he must remain at kalaweo and not leave it on any pretension whatever nor would the board permit the priest at lahaina to visit father damien at kalaweo here an eminent physician one of the board of health pleaded his cause insisting that permission be granted the father to go and come at will this is the rule in all civilized countries said he the priest and the physician are exempt they have privileges which no one else has and which no one else should have the doctor was heartily seconded by the french consul in whose hands the business of the mission was deposited and father damien returned to kalaweo on a special permit shortly after his return he received an official notice that he must remain where he was and that on any attempt to leave the island or even to visit other portions of molokai he would be immediately put under arrest the notice was sharply worded this roused the indignation of the priest and he notified the board of health that if they would attend strictly to their duties he would attend to his when it became necessary for him to visit a priest on a neighboring island he did so asking no odds of any man he also visited his scattered flock on the circuit of molokai attending faithfully and fearlessly to the wants of his people often on these rounds he was the welcome guest of a gentleman the son of a protestant missionary and on one occasion the host said to him playfully i suppose you are aware that i have orders to place you under immediate arrest if you presume to leave your leper settlement and this was the sheriff of molokai six months later a permit came granting father damien leave to come and go as he pleased but in eleven years how seldom has he cared to use it this interview seeming to be an event in the life of my good friend it was celebrated with another pipe and an extra sip of coffee but before the former was finished or the latter had cooled he was called quickly away to attend the bedside of some passing soul chapter eight father damien's duties were never ending from early mass till long after his flock was housed in sleep he was busy and when at last he had sought his pillow it was too often to lie awake planning for the future and perhaps to be called again into the ward rooms to ease the anguish of the sick or the dying the neat white cottages which have taken the place of the thatched huts of the natives were erected under his eye and furthermore he personally assisted in the construction of most of them the small chapel which he found at the settlement has become the transept of the present edifice he with the aid of a handful of lepers enlarged the building painted it without decorated it within and there he daily offers the holy sacrifice of the mass preaches frequently instructs the children and fills all the offices of the church forty orphan boys and girls are under his immediate direction houses with dormitories have been erected for them and the girls under the direction of suitable instructors are taught needlework and the domestic arts it has been found advisable to permit those who are of a marriageable age to marry the partners of their choice and these marriages are duly solemnized in the presence of witnesses the spiritual wants of the priest's flock were sufficient to fully occupy his time on sundays and feast days there was high mass at kalaweo the celebrant was then obliged to hasten to kalapapa and there again offer the divine sacrifice now at noon he was permitted to partake of a little refreshment the first since midnight then back to kalaweo for vespers benediction and catechism over again to kalapapa to repeat the offices and at last at nightfall home once more to look after the affairs of his people 
and to cook his own supper and put his house in order for the night he was indeed jack of all trades physician of the soul and the body magistrate school-teacher carpenter joiner painter gardener housekeeper cook and even in some cases undertaker and grave-digger great was his need of help and long was he in need of it before it came more than sixteen hundred lepers had been buried under his administration and the deathbed was always awaiting him sometimes two or three of them help came to him finally the welcome aid he had so longed for we have not seen father albert yet said he to-morrow i will call for you and we will visit kalapapa chapter nine a light buggy that had seen its best days was standing at the door of the doctor's lodge a very comfortable beast that rejoiced in the name of william was being fastened to the vehicle with such fragments of harness as had survived the wear and tear of time father damien the proud possessor of this conveyance then announced himself in readiness and we set out for kalapapa the rival leper village about two miles distant it was not a bad road we followed thanks to the efforts of the energetic priest but william whose days are numbered evidently has no intention of hurrying through any one of them boy you are a little lazy my william said the father to his pet touching him lightly with the stump of a whip william had paused for a moment apparently lost in the contemplation of nature presently we met a procession of half-handed lepers who were laboriously moving a shanty from one site to another father damien tightened his reins and by way of apology for the possible misbehavior of his steed said he has never seen such a thing poor beast but william being absorbed in thought passed the phenomenon unnoticed and so we came to kalapapa beyond the treeless and undulating plain it is an almost pretty village bright sunshiny and having an air of prosperity no doubt heightened by the newly constructed dock and the freshly painted whaleboat that was beached beside it the lesser lions of kalapapa were soon disposed of and we adjourned to the neatest cottage in the village flowers blossomed before it and the land was steeped in sunshine so was the sea that sparkled but a stone's throw from the dooryard this was the home of father albert who in his age and his infirmities has still the cheerfulness of that sunshine and the sweetness of his well-kept garden spot he welcomed us in his veranda with silver hair and flowing beard books and papers were on his table pictures upon the wall the neatly curtained windows admitted the fresh sea breeze a light repast was offered us the hospitality of these impoverished priests is proverbial and worthy to be remembered with the widow's might close at hand was father albert's chapel it is as quaint as it is cosy full of color odd combinations of color on wall and ceiling father albert whispered it is in barbarous taste but i have sought to please the poor lepers who are fond of this display the altar was like a picture and there was a goodly number of those beautiful mild-faced artistically tinted statues of the saints such as always remind me of the attractive shop windows in the vicinity of st sulpice in paris in the main aisle before the altar stood a french organ of which father albert was justly proud by an ingenious displacement of the keyboard the same chord may be pitched in a higher or lower key without changing the position of the hand upon the keys moreover when desirable through a still more convenient attachment by pressing a finger upon one single note the complementary chord in treble and bass is struck at the same moment it is needless to add that the most indifferent performer need hardly go astray upon this instrument and that the simplest one finger exercise becomes at once quite imposing it was father albert's pleasure to exhibit the automatic accomplishments of this organ and he finished with a graceful old-fashioned waltz measure skilfully rendered 
with the air of one who is not quite indifferent to the charms of melody his thin hands lightly swept the keys while his face retained the sweet gravity that distinguishes it there is a small cemetery almost under the eaves of the chapel where little children are buried as if they would be lonely out yonder on the plain there is a large one with an ornamental gateway painted in black and white in the centre of it stands a tall slender cross and beyond it within hearing is the sea there is a race-track a long stretch of grass-grown road running out to the breezy fishing point with its cluster of rush huts the sea was like crystal all up and down the coast branches of coral and darting fish are visible at great depth sharks are not uncommon visitors and yet there were lepers fishing and bathing among the rocks the strangely shaped lava rocks that at times received the sea and shouldered it off in avalanches of foam this is about all there is at kalapapa though it is the one port of the lepers and a small steamer visits it weekly and sometimes a schooner runs in with a load of long expected freight little else can be said of it save to tell the story of the gentle soul who has come to make his home there father damien's right-hand man his fellow priest but father albert can tell his story much better than i can and i will not touch a line of the letter with which he has favored me end of chapter nine chapters ten through twelve of the lepers of molokai by charles warren stoddard this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 Listen to the story of another of the Catholic missionaries in Hawaii. Born in France, in the Diocese of Coutances, in the year 1825, of pious parents, richer in the gifts of grace than in the fleeting goods of this world. My studies, as far as philosophy inclusive, were pursued with a certain degree of success at the college of avranche and the petit seminaire of mortin and i received my degree of bachelier et lettre at the academy of paris in eighteen forty five i entered the novitiate of the fathers of picpou or of the sacred hearts at the outbreak of the revolution of eighteen forty eight i was sent with several other young professed to chile where i continued my theological studies at the same time teaching in our colleges at valparaiso and santiago after my ordination in eighteen fifty i was at my own request in eighteen fifty two sent to our missions in oceanica attached from the first to the vicariate of tahiti i have remained there a little over twenty years performing the ordinary missionary duties in the archipelago so well named Putmutu. between tahiti and le gambier they form a long train of madreporic islets distant from each other several days sail covered with sand and brush only a few meters above the level of the sea at that time they were divided into two sections the distinction between them being well defined one of which trading for some time in knacker mother of pearl or coconut oil was to some extent civilized but unfortunately some deserters from american whaling vessels introduced mormonism in its highest degree of fanaticism and immorality the other inhabitants were savages cannibals and pagans naturally catholic missionary work would begin with the first and it was already so far advanced as to claim a little band of catechumens and neophytes in three different islands when i arrived myself toward the end of eighteen fifty two at the isle of shen anna the principal one of the group it was also the boulevard stronghold of mormonism whose followers exasperated at the first success of catholicity openly revolted soon after my arrival killed a corporal of the guards burned and pillaged the church and presbytery of the village and seriously wounded two missionaries one of whom carried to the grave the mark of the deep wounds he had received on his head 
I remained several years assisting the first missionaries to spread the good tidings of the gospel in those Mormon isles, and then I obtained from Monsignor Jolin, our vicar apostolic, permission to go to the pagan and savage isles. The annals of the propagation of the faith, the weekly record of the Catholic missions, have published in part a resume of my dangers, my labors, and my success in those isles through which I traveled during five or six years. I believe that my remarkably lean condition saved me several times from the teeth of these cannibals. My bold and firm bearing in some way magnetized those big fat fellows of Canucks, who in moments of a savage fury several times threatened to put an end to me. In 1872, I was the sole survivor of the four first missionaries to the archipelago, but the fatigue and privations endured among these poor isles had completely ruined my health. I was then sent to France, where I arrived about the end of the year 1873. I had the happiness of visiting the new and famous pilgrimages of Pontman, Lourdes, and La Salette. Still better, I had the good fortune to visit Italy, Milan, where I venerated the precious body of St. Charles, resting in a rich mausoleum under the grand altar of the most magnificent church in the whole world, Loretto, where I said Mass twice in the Sancta Casa of Nazareth, Rome, where I remained two weeks and had two audiences with the sovereign pontiff Pius IX, one public, the other private and personal. After so many unexpected graces and blessings, my only desire was to return and die among my dear Pumutu. But the doctors in Paris who were treating me thought it unadvisable and would only permit me to go to the Sandwich Islands, where the climate and food seemed to them more suitable to my condition of health. I arrived here in 1874, and for nearly five years I have been engaged, in company with the celebrated Father Damien, in the care, corporal and spiritual, of my dear brothers, the lepers of Molokai. My health today is perfectly restored, and I feel myself able and ready to rejoin at Pumutu my old confrere, Father Firenz, who wrote lately in the annals of the propagation of the faith that the old Mormon isles are at the present day mostly Catholic and that the savages and pagans are almost wholly civilized and Christianized. I am, however, very happy and content in my present work, and I leave entirely to my superiors to dispose of me as they think best. Chapter 11 The local press of Honolulu, at least a portion of it, has found much fault with the ministry for having neglected to segregate each individual leper in the kingdom long ago. It is true that for some time after the introduction of the plague, the Board of Health took little or no action toward the prevention of its development. But it is likewise true that in the last 15 years, 2,500 lepers have been banished to Molokai. The average death rate is 150 per annum. There are always between 700 and 800 lepers at the settlement, and these are provided for by the government. The last biennial appropriation of $90,000 is insufficient, as the President of the Board of Health asserts. For beside the settlement on Molokai, there is a branch hospital near Honolulu, where doubtful cases are held for treatment, and this is nearly always filled. From this branch hospital called Kaka'ako, the confirmed lepers are shipped to Molokai. Kaka'ako, like Trakidi, is in charge of a sisterhood. The Bishop of Olba, whose life is devoted to the spiritual welfare of the Hawaiian race, at the urgent request of the king and queen, sent Father Leonor to America to obtain, if possible, the aid of such sisters as were able to endure the hardships of service in Hawaii. Seven ladies of the Franciscan order, established at Syracuse, New York, were shortly on their way. Others are expected to join them, 
and then some of these devoted sisters will locate at the leper settlement on molokai the settlement has been visited by the princess regent and if i mistake not by the queen also both take the deepest interest in the welfare of the unfortunates and in eighteen eighty four a very successful fair was held in honolulu for the benefit of the lepers on this occasion the several booths were in charge of the queen two princesses and the first ladies of the little capital nor is the king unmindful of the devotion of the catholic mission to the good work in eighteen eighty one bishop herman then coadjutor to the late bishop magre paid a formal visit to Kalaweo. It was a great day for the leper settlement. The bishop was to be received with salutes, music, and banners. Triumphal arches were erected. Presently, all being in readiness, a swarm of volunteers went out to watch for the first signs of his lordship's approach. Intense excitement prevailed, and when at last a group of tiny figures was discovered climbing down the huge precipice above Kalaweo, the enthusiasm of the poor lepers knew no bounds. It was a happy day for Father Damien, but he was not then aware of the fete that was in store for him. When the bishop reached the base of the poly, the cliff, he was received by Father Damien and a deputation from Kalaweo. They then mounted horses and rode solemnly into the plain. The good bishop, who had been overtaken by a rainstorm, was drenched to the skin, but his discomfiture was soon forgotten, for at the first triumphal arch he was received by a body of eight hundred lepers, with banners flying. Cheers rent the air, the brass band, lepers all of them, struck up a march, and the procession advanced on Kalaweo. In front of the chapel was another arch, more beautiful than the first. Here the entire population had assembled to welcome the distinguished visitor. He excused himself for a few moments only, in order to change his dripping garments for dry ones, and returned to receive the formal welcome and congratulations of the inhabitants. Songs were sung, addresses of welcome delivered, and then his lordship rose to reply. The delight of Father Damien, the most modest of men, had almost made him bold, but to his embarrassment he found himself summoned by his superior to receive publicly the congratulations of the many who were eager to express their admiration and gratitude for the noble self-sacrifice displayed by the young priest. Moreover, added the lordship, i am commissioned by his majesty to place upon your neck this testimonial of his esteem and with that the bishop hung upon the breast of the bewildered father the glittering cross of a knight commander of the order of kalakaua the first a thousand voices rent the air cheer upon cheer cheer upon cheer awoke the slumbering echoes of that silent shore and there were those who wept with joy at the honor so justly conferred upon their beloved pastor. Father Damien, in his confusion, was about to remove the bauble when he was at once ordered by the bishop to allow it to remain, at least so long as he was a guest at Kalaweo. And again the banners waved, the women wept, and the shouts of the people mingled with the trumpet blast of the band boys for a red-letter day had stolen unexpectedly into the melancholy annals of Kalaweo. Chapter 12 High Mass at Kalaweo The solemn mystery offered almost in the spirit of a requiem, for the participants are doomed, and the living are well-nigh dead. I was directed by Father Damien to a small enclosure at the left of the altar. It was not unlike a witness-box, a railing enclosed the single seat and no leper was ever permitted to open the gate that shut me in the neatly robed sanctuary boys were all disfigured some with pitiful distorted features but fortunately none of these seemed to suffer any pain or much inconvenience though fingers and toes are in many cases missing and the eyelids are thickened and drawn out of shape the very beautiful sacramental vessels of richly wrought gold 
were sent to Father Damien by the superior of St. Roche in Paris. They are used only at High Mass. With the greatest sweetness and gravity, the celebrant proceeded. The chapel was filled with worshippers, and all of them seemed to be singing or trying to sing simple refrains that sounded strangely enough in the hoarse throats of the singers. The devotion of the Catholic Hawaiian is remarkable because the race is much given to childish levity and i have nowhere else seen such evidences of genuine contrition certainly not in the meetings presided over by native ministers the american protestant missionaries having retired from the field and left it in the hands of the aborigines what a contrast was here the bright altar cleanly furnished the young priest a picture of health chanting with clear ringing voice the paternoster at his feet the acolytes upon whose infant features was already fixed the seal of early death beyond the altar railing corruption ran riot there was scarcely a form in that whole congregation from which one would not turn with horror and many of these worshippers seemed actually to have risen from the corruption of the grave the solemn boom of the sea surf was fit accompaniment to that most solemn service and the long low sough of the sea wind was like a sigh of sympathy the very air was polluted the fetid odor of the charnel house pervaded it and all that chamber of horrors seemed but the portal of the tomb this is the feast of the master as celebrated at kalaweo and to celebrate it thus is father damien's blessed privilege i thought of that verse in st luke and as he entered into a certain town there met him ten men that were lepers who stood afar off and lifted up their voice saying jesus master have mercy on us verily their prayer is answered for he hath mercy on them and blesses them in the person of this his servant end of chapter twelve chapters thirteen through fifteen and the epilogue of the lepers of molokai by charles warren stoddard this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen there is yet much to be done for the lepers many who seem whole and sound who are still in the full enjoyment of life and liberty are doubtless the unconscious victims of a disease that has been declared incurable by the best medical testimony of the age the germ has been planted it has possibly been inherited and sooner or later it will make itself visible the law of segregation must be enforced until the last leper has ended his miserable existence and the survivors are delivered from the ravages of the plague the fear of contagion and of possible infection hangs over the ill-fated kingdom the hawaiians are a susceptible people possessed of much physical beauty and of but little strength and endurance they succumb easily under the influence of diseases that with us are of small moment with them the measles are almost as much to be dreaded as the smallpox they need the same watchful care that one gives to an unreasoning child they have lives of reckless intercourse and seem to invite epidemics your hawaiian in a high fever will deliberately plunge into the sea and remain there in the hope of cooling off the chill of the grave too often follows this amazing act of stupidity the lepers once gathered together should be forbidden all intercourse with those who are not leprous they have no fear of contagion they divide their garments among their friends they pass a pipe from mouth to mouth indian fashion they marry even where one or the other is known to be leprous at kakaako the lepers are on one side of a high picket fence their friends on the other side spend hours daily in affectionate intercourse passing the pipe back and forth fondling one another and even kiss at meeting and parting 
that the sisters of kakaako who certainly have their own poor lodgings but who are constantly mingling with the lepers may yet fall victims to the plague is by no means unlikely even where great care is taken to avoid contact with a leprous person or a leprous object the leprosy has finally developed and in such cases the direct cause of it cannot be traced father damien's escape after eleven years of intimacy with the worst known cases after having nursed the sick and buried the dead more than sixteen hundred of them can be looked upon as almost miraculous he is working with them and for them night and day his intimates are lepers his house is hardly ever free of them it is true that he does his own cooking and his own housework and whatever is to be done about the altar a native not a leper washes for him and mends his clothing when necessary but the tools that are so often in his hands are handled by lepers and whatever is passed about the village comes to him from those who are to put it broadly in all stages of decomposition this is also the case with all who are brought in contact with lepers at large those who are not at the settlement and it must continue to be the case so long as a leper is left unconfined i remember how one day as we were walking among the wards of the hospital at kalaweo father damien turned suddenly to us and said ah here's something dreadful i must show you we approached what seemed a little bundle of rags or rubbish half hidden under a soiled blanket the curious doctors were about to examine it when the good father seized me and cried excitingly you must not look you must not look i assured him that i was not at all afraid to see even the worst that could be shown me there for my eyes had become accustomed to horrors and the most sickening sights no longer affected me a corner of the blanket was raised cautiously a breathing object lay beneath a face a human face was turned slowly towards us a face in which scarcely a trace of anything human remained the dark skin was puffed out and blackened a kind of moss or mould gummy and glistening covered it the muscles of the mouth having contracted laid bare the grinning teeth the thickened tongue lay like a fig between them the eyelids curled tightly back exposed the inner surface and the protruding eyeballs now shapeless and broken looked not unlike bursted grapes it was a leprous child who within the last few days had assumed that horrible visage surely the grave knows nothing more frightful than this similar cases are rare perhaps this was the only one of precisely such a nature but the uncomplaining sufferer before us was after all merely a leper and so long as leprosy remains in the land other victims like unto this one may sit watching and praying for death from hour to hour within the last few weeks a hospital or home for leprous children has been founded at kakaako near honolulu it was solemnly opened by their majesties the king and queen the queen gave the key of it into the hands of the superior of the sisters who have charge of the branch hospital at kakaako then the king graciously decorated the lady with the order of kapolani father leonore through whose earnest efforts the aid of the admirable franciscan sisters was secured has also been decorated by the king indeed their majesties and the present cabinet have shown the deepest interest in the welfare of the lepers and probably all that it is possible to do for their relief and for the security of the nation is being done in this respect the little kingdom of hawaii is worthy of the sympathy and the admiration of the world better accommodations are needed at the settlement a much larger appropriation and as for the priests who have consecrated their lives to this glorious work of mercy is there any wish of theirs which should not be heeded any request with which the government should not comply chapter fourteen in those last days 
I used to seek the father and find him. Now at the top of a ladder, hammer and nail in hand, or in the garden, or the hospital ward, or the kitchen, or away on a sick call, as the case might be. It was seldom he could sit with me, for not a moment was he really free. Once I captured him on a plea of paying my parting call. With the greatest reluctance, and only at my urgent request, he went in search of his decoration. It was found in its neat Morocco case, hidden away in an unvisited corner, with the dust an inch thick on it. It is not for this that I am here, said he disparagingly, and he acknowledged that he had never put the ribbon about his neck. Indeed, he had hardly looked at the bauble since the day when the bishop desired him to wear it for the gratification of his simple flock. Once I wandered alone into the chapel. A small organ was standing near an open window. Beyond the window was the very pandanus tree under which Father Damien found shelter when he first came to Kalaweo. I sat at the instrument dreaming over the keys and thinking of the life one must lead in such a spot, of the need and the lack of human sympathy, of the solitude of the soul destined to a communion with perpetual death. And hearing a slight rustling near me, I turned and found the chapel nearly filled with lepers who had silently stolen in one after another at the sound of the organ. The situation was rather startling, but when I asked where Father Damien might be found, they directed me and stood aside to let me pass. I found him where I might have known he was likely to be found, working bravely among his men, he by far the most industrious of them all. As I approached them unobserved, the bell of the little chapel rang out the Angelus. On the instant they all knelt, uncovered, and in their midst the priest recited the beautiful prayer, to which they responded in soft, low voices, while the gentle breeze rustled the broad leaves about them, and the sun poured a flood of glory upon their bowed forms. Lepers all of them, save the good pastor, and soon to follow in the ghastly procession, whose motionless bodies he blesses in their peaceful sleep, Angelus Domini, was that sight not pleasing in the eyes of God? Chapter 15 Farewell The time had come to say farewell. The evening before our departure we saw a pleasant phase of life at the leper settlement. The little steamer that visits them at intervals was due. Long before sunset, a faint smoke cloud on the horizon heralded her approach, and the news spread like wildfire from Kalaweo to Kalapapa. The excitement grew as the steamer drew near, and when she passed the little land of the proscribed and blew a shrill, long blast that was echoed in a half-dozen neighboring valleys, everyone who was able to leave his bed was on his way to the landing. Many horses are owned at the settlement, and there is dry pasturage for many more, the cavalcade and the infantry soon depopulated one village and filled the other to overflowing. More lepers were arriving and were welcomed with tears of sympathy to their new home. The scene was pathetic beyond description, and were it not evident that the exiles are as comfortable and as happy in course of time on Molokai as they can be anywhere in the world, nature would revolt at the spectacle. It is undoubtedly best as it is, and it is as well as it can be under the circumstances. That was a gala night at Kalapapa, but we were thinking most of our departure on the morrow. We had chosen another trail up the Pali. There are but two, and it may almost be said of them that each is more dreadful than the other. As is usually the case, we were assured that the ascent was easy, that it had been made in fifty minutes and without suffering much fatigue. We began gaily enough. The path bordered a pretty curve of the shore and then led up onto a wooded plateau where the view was charming, the air delicious. For a time we threaded a grove, 
and beyond that the trail was shaded at intervals while the underbrush hedged us in as we rounded the shoulders of the cliff anon came steep acclivities with stretches of bare sun-heated rocks where our hearts fainted at least mine did there was one terrible bit of wall-like cliff that was almost perpendicular it crumbled as we clung to it like cats and when i looked below to find footing i discovered that the rock upon which i was stretched in an agony of suspense was apparently overhanging the sea the deep green water was far below me i felt as if i were climbing into the sky and then i nearly fell from sheer fright but a cloud blew down upon us they fly low in that latitude in this thin disguise i tried to forget that i was suspended in mid-air by my eyelids with nothing but sole leather between me and a thousand feet of space with certain death at the lower end of it we were rained upon and shined upon covered with dust and debris and when we reached the top of the poly i was dizzy and parched with thirst it was my last ascent we made it in two hours and forty minutes with my heart knocking wildly at my ribs all the way up. It is the mountain of difficulty. Surely no leper may ever hope to scale it. Nor was ever so weird a spot dedicated to such sorrow and long-suffering before. With health and companionship one might endure banishment, but these lepers are dying by inches. They sit about much of the time with an air of hopeless resignation sit there waiting for the grave to open and receive them the martyrs of molokai if we pity the lepers who are fortunately soon comforted after every grief what shall we say of those servants of god who have dedicated their lives to this noble work think of their unutterable loneliness shut in between vast stretches of sea and sky a solitude that has driven men mad before now they receive no guests, for no one cares to visit them. Very few of their friends write to them, for some are even afraid to receive a reply. Their meager rations are sometimes unavoidably cut short, yet one hears no complaint from them in their own behalf. It is always a compassionate appeal in behalf of their suffering charges. These are their companions if the uncompanionable can be called such these the helpless and the hopeless and over the devoted heads of those involuntary martyrs hangs ever the possible yea the probable fate that is hourly expiated in revolting and ignominious death take heed o people lest in these self-sacrificing ministers ye entertain an angel unawares untrumpeted incomparable heroes verily they shall receive their reward epilogue when i laid down my pen at the close of the last chapter of this lamentable narrative it was with a sigh of relief that i turned to more cheerful themes i believed that the worst had been told and that henceforth i could think of the pastor of molokai as of one standing sentinel over the haunt of affliction wrestling night and day with the angel of death his body clean as the soul that encases it uncontaminated in the midst of contamination an impenetrable armor shielding him from the poison darts that assail him on every hand and he a living witness to the certitude of a special providence such indeed he has been for more than a decade but within a twelvemonth from the time when together we sat with the dead and the dying when i saw with my own eyes the evidences of his wholesome and holy influence and heard with my own ears of the works of mercy to which he has consecrated his life heard it from the lips of those whose hearts were overflowing with gratitude in one brief year he has been seized treacherously i might almost say and his fate is sealed in common with that of his ill-starred flock yet there is more christian valor in his surrender than in many a conquest that is blazoned in the annals of history 
Listen to these passages from a letter recently received from Kalaweo. Since March last, my confrere Father Albert has left Molokai and this archipelago, and has returned to Tahiti and the Pumutu. I am now the only priest on Molokai, and am supposed to be myself afflicted with this terrible disease. Impossible for me to go any more to Honolulu, on account of the leprosy breaking out on me. Those microbes have finally settled themselves in my left leg and my ear, and one eyebrow begins to fall. I expect to have my face soon disfigured. Having no doubt myself of the true character of my disease, I feel calm, resigned, and happier among my people. Almighty God knows what is best for my own sanctification. And with that conviction, I say daily a good fiat voluntas tua. Please pray for your afflicted friend and recommend me and my unhappy people to all servants of the Lord. It is the beginning of the end. Already his garment is a winding sheet, and the grave awaits him in the mouth of the dark valley. Is this the reward of virtue and of piety, humility and devotion? No. All worldly distinctions are as nothing in comparison with the home which awaits him eternal in the heavens. Death, even such a death as his, comes honorably to one who exchanges a life of voluntary sacrifice for a crown of glory. A little while, and he will have perished in the foul embraces of that ghoulish monster whose ill-begotten brood is scattered even unto the ends of the earth. It is not impossible, yea, it is not improbable, that at some future time in these United States, it may become necessary to enact special laws for the protection of the people at large and the segregation of those who have fallen victims to the most dreadful of all scourges. The seeds of the plague are sown in the track of the Chinese coolie, and the fact should be considered in season, for anon we may hear the hopeless cry ringing from shore to shore, Too late, too late. Reverend and Beloved Father, at your feet I lay this tribute in memory of our last sad meeting and parting. In my heart you live forever. Nothing can touch you further. And when you are laid to rest, I believe that you will have achieved a record of modest heroism almost without parallel in these times. Degradation it may be in the eyes of many, the death in life, the slow, sure-footed decay. But out of the loam of this corruptible body springs heavenward the invisible blossom of the soul. O oh, my friend, forget me not, as I cannot cease to remember thee, when the fragrance of that flower shall gladden the paths of paradise. End of the epilogue. End of The Lepers of Molokai by Charles Warren Stoddard.